All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Eaglebrook Church. Really good to have you with us today at all of our campuses and watching online as well. Before I dive in, I want to celebrate what God did last weekend. We had 1,147 people get baptized out at Lake Johanna at Northwestern. Isn't that unbelievable? I was standing on the shoreline, and as we're baptizing people, you'll see some boats and paddle boarders who get curious. They just kind of want to know, like, what's going on? Because there's this big crowd on the shore. And I stood there thinking to myself, if you weren't a Christian, what do you think's going on right now? Because physically, all we're doing is just slamming people under the water. <laughs> and then they get up out of the water, and they're like, yes, you know, <laughs> joyful hands in the air, tears coming down their face. And if I'm not a Christian, I'm going, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. But it's because when we dunk people under the water, that's not what's really happening. It's not just physical. It's spiritual. That a person is dying to their old life and they're coming up to a new life in Jesus Christ. And there's this power when you walk in the freedom and forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can offer a person. If you were someone who was baptized last weekend, we want to say we are so proud of you and we are praying for you that you would stay strong in your faith. All right, today we are continuing on in a series called The Four Wills of God. We got that title from a book by Dr. Emerson Egerich. And in the book, Egerich points out that there are only four verses in the entire Bible that use the words, this is God's will. I had never noticed that before. We tend to think of God's will in terms of what is God's will for my life? Should I take this job or should I take that job? Should we move to Portland or should we stay where we're living? But a more important question is, what is God's will? And four different times, God clearly says, this is my will. When I applied for a teaching pastor position here at Eagle Brook about 12 years ago, I had another church that had offered me a job, and it was a, a great church, similar position. And so I was asking this question, God, what is your will for my life? And I remember talking to Bob Merritt, our senior pastor, on the phone. I wasn't even on staff yet. And he told me the story that when he came to Eagle Brook, there was three churches that wanted him as their senior pastor. And all three of them told him, it is God's will for you to be the senior pastor at our church. And he thought, well, two of you have got to be wrong, right? It's two of you are missing the signal there somehow because it's not God's will for me to be the senior pastor at all three of those churches. But Bob said he came to understand that he could be in God's will at any of the three churches. That if he would trust Christ and obey God and work hard, he would be in the center of God's will. In other words, God's will isn't so much about the job you take, but it's the life you live in that job. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray about decisions, that we shouldn't ask God for guidance. We should. But it does mean that God's will is broader than what job you take. In fact, I wonder if sometimes people struggle to know what God's unique will is for their life. In other words, should I take the job or should I not? Because they're not obeying one of these four verses in the Bible where God clearly says, this is my will. What are those four verses? Well, in week one, we said it was to believe in Jesus Christ. It's God's will that every one of us would have a relationship with him through his son. Then last week, we saw that it's God's will for us to be grateful and thankful in all circumstances. Not thankful for our circumstances, but thankful in our circumstances. And today's message is titled, Submit in Doing Good. Here's the verse in the Bible where God says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Here's the specific statement. He says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now notice the context here. He's talking about government authorities. He says that we should submit to those. He then gives some specific examples. He says, emperor and governor which the equivalent for us today might be president, senators, government officials. It's God's will that we would submit to their authority in our life. 
He then, in addition, says that we should submit to the laws that are made to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Here's what's interesting about what Peter wrote. Peter wrote these words to a group of Christians who were living most likely under an emperor named Nero. Nero was not a good emperor. He killed Christians. This gets rather graphic, but it was said that Nero would take the body of Christians, he would put them on poles, light them on fire, and he would use that to light up the grounds of his palace. He was a vile, evil human being. And yet here's Peter coming along to these Christians and he says, you should submit to the emperor. You should submit to the laws of your land who commend those who, who punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Years ago, I was in uh, college and I was taking a class in the countries of Greece and Turkey. I was studying the Bible there and it was the year 2000 and the Vikings were playing the saints in a playoff game. And I really wanted to watch this game. Now, this was before smartphones. This was before tablets. This is before there was Wi-Fi everywhere. Some of you are like, what is this, like Little House in the Prairie days? <laughs> no, it was 19 years ago. And so if I wanted to watch this game, I had to find what was called an internet cafe. So I went down to the front desk. The clerk said, yeah, the hotel right across the street has one. So I went outside, and this hotel was literally right across the street. It was right there. But there was about a five or six foot wall that separated my hotel from this other hotel. And this wall extended a mile and a half down to the road, and there was a sign on the wall that said, do not climb. So I had a couple of options. I could either walk a mile and a half down to the road, around this wall, a mile and a half back to the hotel that's right there, or I can just climb the wall. I climbed the wall. <laughs> went and watched the Vikings game at the Internet Cafe. When I was done, I went back. I was climbing over the wall again when I heard some footsteps pounding on the pavement behind me. I turned around, and there was a Turkish security guard running towards me as fast as he could, waving a pistol over his head. He got up to me, he leveled the gun right between my eyes, and he mumbled something in Turkish. I don't know Turkish. <laughs> really did, wished I did at that time. This was quite the international moment. I was yelling out things in English, he was yelling out things in Turkish. Finally, he pointed at the wall, he pointed the gun at me, and he went, Boing, boing. That's exactly how he said it. Boing, boing. Apparently that's international language for I'm going to shoot you. I said, are you going to shoot me if I climb over that wall? He nodded and pointed at the road. So I had to start taking the walk of shame. I start walking a mile and a half towards this road. As I get closer, two more security guards come out holding AK-47s. No kidding. It was pitch dark at night in a foreign country, nobody around, walking to the road with two guys with AK-47s behind me. But just think about this for a moment. I looked at that sign and I said, dumb rule, dumb law, not going to obey that, not going to walk down, I'm just going to climb over. And I almost got boing boinged as a result. <laughs> but isn't that how it is with submission? The reason why we don't submit to something is because we don't want to. We want to do what we want to do. We think that that rule or that law is dumb. We think that decision isn't a good one. But look at the verse again. Does it say submit if you agree? No, it doesn't say that. Does it say submit if you think it's a good decision? It doesn't say that. He simply says submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. What are those? Well, God in his wisdom has placed human authorities over each of us. There's not a person here today who doesn't have some authority over them. And it is God's will that we would submit to the levels and layers of human authorities that God has put into our life. Now, these human authorities aren't in every situation. In fact, today I'm going to give you three situations that I think all of us are called to submit in. 
And these are right out of 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3. But here's what we're going to discover. If you will submit to God in these three situations, even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't want to, I believe that God is going to bless your life. I believe that God's favor and honor will be upon your life. Here's the first area we're all called to submit, and it's at home. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse 1. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first of the Ten Commandments that ends with a promise. And this is the promise. If you honor your father and mother, you will live a long life full of blessing. Notice that he doesn't say honor your father or your mother. Wouldn't that be nice? Dad's pretty strict. I think I'm just going to go with mom. I I connect better with dad. I I think I'll just go with him. We'll, We'll leave mom out of this one. It doesn't give you that option. He says, honor your father and your mother. Some of us say, yeah, but how am I supposed to honor my father or my mother? Because they were so dishonorable. Some of us had a parent who abused us. Some of us had parents who were addicted And would come home violent and drunk. Some of us have parents who are emotionally manipulative to us. And so you hear those words, honor your father and mother, and something just rises up in you. To be really clear, here's what honor does not mean. Does not mean you put up with abusive behavior. Does not mean you don't set boundaries around that relationship. It doesn't even mean that you spend any time with that parent. Here's what the word honor means in the original Greek and Hebrew. It means to put a heavy weight or emphasis on. In other words, what did your mom or dad do really well? And how could you say, you know, in spite of the things that you didn't do well, I'm going to lay a heavy weight on the things that you did well in my life. That's what it means to honor your father and your mother. Now, if I could speak directly to the teenagers here for just a moment. When I was growing up, I didn't know this verse. And so when I got to college, I felt really guilty about how I had treated my parents in high school. I would sulk. I was moody. I was argumentative. I was angry. And some of that was just hormonal, but some of it was me. I remember one time there was a huge blizzard. And I wanted to go over to my friend's house, and my dad was like, no, you're not driving in this weather. We didn't live real close to this friend. And I just freaked out. I'm like, everybody's going over to Berg's house. You're the most strict parent. This is so unfair. This is so stupid. All the other parents are letting their kids go. And my dad stuck to his no. About a month later, there was another blizzard, and reluctantly, my dad let me drive to work. But he was very clear. He said, you need to drive extra slow. The roads are not good. Now today, I think my parents are two of the wisest people that I know. But back then, I was way smarter than they were. (laughs) I didn't drive slow. I drove a little faster than normal. And all of a sudden, as I was driving down this road, my car started to spin out in the middle of the road. The back end of my car hit a snowbank. And the snowbank was so high from the plow pushing up the snow that my car hit the snowbank and flipped over it and rolled end over end three times down into the ditch. The first time that the car rolled over and I was upside down, I was in complete shock. The second time the car rolled over and I was upside down, I was shocked I was still alive. The third time the car rolled over and I was upside down, I thought, I should have listened to my dad. (laughs) Your parents might not be as dumb as you think they are. And just like God says no to us at times, because he wants the very best for our life, that's why your parents say no to you. It's because they love you and they want the best for your life. I was reading Seventeen Magazine recently. It's still the most popular teenage magazine on the market. Some of you are like, why were you reading that? I was researching a message. I wasn't just sitting at the beach reading Seventeen magazine. 
trust me, I put it down. I was reading Girl, Wash Your Face after that, right? So I just <laughs> touching all the bases. But I was looking through Seventeen magazine, and I don't know if I missed it or not, but the articles in there, none of them talked about honoring your parents. None of them talked about respecting your parents. None of them even talked about asking your parents for advice. Not surprising, because we live in a culture that tends to be suspicious of authority figures. Add to that the fact that ever since the beginning of time, there's something in every teenager that goes, I just want to rebel. I want to break away and you know, do what my parents are not asking me to do. But teenagers, here's a thought for you. If you want to rebel, honor your father and mother. Nobody's doing that these days. You'd have the corner market on it. You, you don't have to vape. You don't have to get a tat. You don't have to dress in black. You don't have to listen to some unknown indie band. All you have to do is just honor your father and mother. And I'm telling you, if you will have that kind of character, if you will have that kind of self-control, Here's what God's going to do. God's going to bless your life. Your life, it might be a long life. It might be a blessing in some other kind of way. But God is going to bless your life. See, I believe the number one sign of maturity in a teenager's life is being okay with a no. Can you be okay with a no? When your parents say, no, you can't do that. No, you can't go there. No, You can disagree. You can push back. You can talk about that. But at the end of the day, you have to say, you know what? They are the authority over me, and I just have to be okay with a no. Can you do that? By the way, parents, we need to model this. If, what do you think is going to happen if dad speaks to his wife like she's one of the kids? Speaks down to her, demeans her, constantly criticizes her? Do you think those kids are going to grow up to honor their mother? No. What happens when mom talks about dad like he's just foolish and has no respect for him? Do you think those kids are going to grow up to honor their father? No, they're not. You have to create a culture of honor in your household. Encourage your spouse in front of the kids. Lift them up in front of the kids. And when you don't do that, apologize, not just to your spouse, but to the kids. My wife and I realized recently that when we get stressed out, we talk to each other in a tone that we wouldn't want the kids to use with each other. And so we just had to apologize to the kids and say, you know what, that, it's not okay for us to speak when we're stressed out like that. We got to get better at that. You got to create a culture of honor in your house. Peter talks about this a little bit later in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they don't believe in Christ, they may be won over without words, but by the purity and reverence of your lives. Now, I realize that some wives see these, this phrase, submit yourselves to your husbands, and, and you get a little ticked about that because you think that means suppress you, silence you, push you down. And I'm telling you, that's not Peter's intention at all. Because look at what he says just a few verses later. He says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. If the husband is doing that, much easier for a wife to submit to his leadership. Ephesians 5 says that husbands should lay down their life for their wife. Much easier to follow someone and respect someone who's considerate of you, who's willing to lay down their life for you. Peter goes on, he says this, she may be weaker than you are. Let me clarify this real quickly. I'm not trying to add to the Bible. I'm not trying to take away from the Bible. But I just want to point out that Peter wrote those words before there was Anytime Fitness, Snap Fitness, 24-Hour Fitness, <laughs> LA Fitness. Okay? Okay. And so I think we would all agree that men tend to be stronger. I don't think that's a controversial statement. Scientists would say that's true. But this isn't a general st or a statement that applies to every specific situation. Because I was working out a few weeks ago doing these things, and there was a woman next to me doing the exact same thing, and she was doing more weight than I was. So I want to point that out because I feel like someone's going to come up to me after the service, but I'm not weaker than you are. I'm like, I know, okay? <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. So you're right. 
This isn't apply to everyone, but he says this. She is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. That's the key part. That they're equal partners, that they have equal value and worth before God. And then he says this, if you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. I wonder if this is why some husbands have such a weak prayer life. They pray about a promotion. They pray about something in their life, and then it doesn't happen. And they get angry at God, and they're like, oh, God's not real. God doesn't answer prayers today. And God's up there going, no, 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 no. I'm just not listening to you because of how you treat your wife. Your prayers aren't going to be heard. Is there an area of your life right now where you just need to submit? And you say, but you don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. I mean, I'm not going to respect them. I'm not going to honor them. They don't deserve my respect. They don't deserve my honor. In the book that I referenced earlier, The Four Wills of God, Dr. Emerson Egridge tells a story about a woman who came to faith in Christ later on in life, and then, but her marriage was really struggling. And here's what she wrote in that book. She said, my husband disliked being around me, didn't talk to me for days. Some of you know what this is like. He told me on numerous occasions that we were too different. And once the kids who were six and four were grown up, we would get divorced. Ever heard of something like that before? Let's just get through high school. Come on, we we just just get through high school. You stay out of my way, I'll stay out of your way. And then when the kids are graduated and they're off on their own, you know, then we're gonna end this thing. She said, when I became a Christian, I started to read what the Bible said about marriage. And I had a hard time with words like submit and respect. I thought, I don't want to respect him. He doesn't deserve my respect. And he didn't. But God started to soften my heart. I thought, I can't control how my husband will respond. But I can obey God myself. So I tried to respect him even when I didn't feel like it. Even when he didn't deserve it, I looked for ways to honor him and encourage him. I quietly lived out my faith, and he noticed. One day, my husband came to me and said, I want what you have. I need what you have. He surrendered his life to Christ, and today I don't recognize the man that I married. After 13 years, I can say that our marriage is tender, fun, honoring, joyful, intimate, and loving. It's a miracle. Friends, God wants to do a miracle in your marriage. I hope that you believe that today. I hope that you know that where you are right now may not be where you are years from now. And you say, well, I've tried. I've tried to go see a counselor. I've tried to do the best I can. They're not reciprocating. You can't control how your spouse is going to respond. But you can control if you obey God or not. You can try to respect, you can try to encourage, you can try to live out your faith. And Peter says, if you quietly do that, the hope is over time your spouse would see and they would be won over. But all of us are called to submit at home in some way. Here's the second area of our life where we're called to submit and it's at work. If you have a job, you most likely have a boss. And that boss, at least at work, is a human authority over you. But here's what I begin to discover. Many people don't respect their boss. I was talking to someone recently about this. Years ago, I worked at a place where we had a person who left, and it was kind of a mutual parting from the organization. And after they left, I talked to three different people about what it was like to lead them. Three different supervisors. And all of them said the same thing. Said I couldn't lead them. They didn't listen to me. They just did whatever they wanted to do, and they disregarded what I said. They didn't respect me. They looked down upon me and always thought they could do it better. Ironically, when I talked to this person, they seemed unaware that others perceived them that way. They kept telling me that they were right and were unaware that other people saw them as self-righteous and difficult to lead. Some people don't like to be led. They chafe at things like leadership and organization and structure, all things that make a successful company or church. 
But here's what I believe. The best leaders are the best followers. The best leaders are the ones who have learned to submit to authority in areas of their life. It's because all of us are under authority. At work, I'm under the authority of Bob Merritt, our senior pastor. Unless he asks me to sin, I need to do what he's asked me to do. Now, I can disagree. I can push back. I can you know, argue my case. But at the end of the day, if I'm still told to do something, I either need to do that or find a different job. Bob is under the authority of our church board. He can't just do whatever he wants whenever he wants to do it. If our church board tells him to do something, he can push back, he can disagree, but at the end of the day, he's under their authority. Our church board is under the authority of our congregation and Jesus Christ. Every single one of us lives under authority. And so the best leaders have developed the ability to lead up to their supervisor while at the same time submitting when necessary. When I was 21 years old, I worked as a youth pastor. And when I first started working there, I was in awe of the people I worked with. I mean, I just was taking it in, taking notes, couldn't believe I got to sit at the table. And then I turned 23, read a couple blogs, took a couple graduate classes, and I thought, I can do it better. Everybody gets to this point, usually in their mid-20s, I think I could do it better than you. And so I started to call into question decisions that were made. I started to question leadership in a disrespectful way to other people. And I thought I was right. I was self-righteous. I thought that I was speaking out. No, I was sinning. Looking back, I can see it's a lot easier to criticize when you're not the one who's leading. If you are not in charge then God did not put you in charge. And you can whine and you can complain about all the stupid people and the stupid decisions, but you are only revealing your own immaturity. Here's how I try to do this on a daily basis. Publicly, I honor my bosses. Privately, I might challenge. I say to people, you pay me for my opinion. I'm not just going to sit here. I'm going to share my opinion. I'm going to argue my case. But at the end of the day, around that table, there's somebody who's been designated to make that decision. And if they don't go with my way and my decision, I walk out of those doors and I try to own it like it's my own. Is that hard to do? Yeah, it is, especially when you disagree. But if you can't learn obedience in the little things, then you may not be ready to obey when it counts. See, I've had times in my life where I've realized this isn't a case of bad authority. This is just me being a poor submitter. And so let me ask you, is there an area of your life where you look at a decision and you go, I, I don't like that decision at all. But I've stated my case. I've said what had to be said. And now I just need to decide what I'm going to do. I just need to submit. Is there a person in your life like that? For some of us, it might be a teacher. I'm blown away sometimes at how I see parents talk to their kid's teacher. Like your 13-year-old comes home and has something that's wrong with class, and without even asking questions of the teacher, you just start to unload on them. Your 13-year-old isn't in charge of that class. You're not in charge of that class. You can complain. You can share your disagreements. You can talk openly. You can even take that to the principal if you want to. But at the end of the day, the teacher has the authority in that class. Your kid's coach. Yeah, but I don't like the playing time. I don't like the system. They favor their kid. All those things might be true, but you didn't sign up to coach. You're a fan. You cheer. They're the coach. They coach. You can bring your disagreements. You can bring your arguments, but at the end of the day, you just have to submit. Is there some level of authority like that in your life right now? God has called all of us to submit at work. Here's the final area that God's called us to submit in, and it's to Jesus Christ. Every one of us is called to submit to Jesus Christ. See, there's something in human nature that goes, I don't want to do it. If my parents tell me to do it, I don't want to do it. If my boss tells me to do it, I don't want to do it. If God tells me to do it, I don't want to do it. 
But this is why I say to people, this is not an issue of you submitting to your boss or your parent. This is an issue of you submitting to God. Are you willing to trust that he is in control? It's an issue of faith. Every one of us is called to submit to Jesus Christ. Before the Anoka campus baptism, there was a young woman named Talia who told her story. She said that when she was in high school, she had been lukewarm in her faith. And she said, I kind of like that. I, I could thank God for a blessing, you know, now and then. I, I could go to him when life wasn't going well, but I didn't have to obey him when I didn't want to. She said, then I lived like that until my younger brother, Antonio, tragically died when he was in his early 20s. She said, it was my worst nightmare. Unsure how to cope with the pain, she became addicted to alcohol. She said, I was afraid to be sober. I just wanted to numb the pain and forget what was happening in my life. Hiding it from family and friends, she finally ended up in the hospital from an alcohol-related panic attack. And Talia said, that's when I realized that I am slowly killing myself. And so she stood up at the baptism and she said, today I have been sober for 300 days and I am being baptized because I am fully surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. When I heard her say those words, I was choked up. You see, I was Talia's youth pastor. And I remember praying for her when she was in high school. Praying that her faith wouldn't be lukewarm anymore. And that she would fully submit and surrender to him. When I was 21, I had baptized her brother and sister in their backyard swimming pool. And last weekend, 19 years later, I baptized Talia. As I was baptizing her, I looked her in the eye. And I said, Talia, God has made you just as you are. He created you to be a leader. And I said, I believe that if you will fully surrender to him and obey him, even when you don't want to, even when you don't feel like it, that God is going to heal you. And God is going to restore what has been lost. And I believe that for each of us today. That if you're at a place in your life where you're saying, God, I, I trust you, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. That if you will fully surrender to Jesus Christ, that there will be a healing, there will be a restoration, there will be a blessing in your life. Jesus Christ, the night before he was taken to the cross, he knew what was happening. And he didn't want to die a painful death for us. And so he was praying to God and asking, God, is there any way that I don't have to go through with this? And finally, he prayed these famous words. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Anyone here today need to pray that prayer? Lord, not my will doesn't have to be my way. It doesn't have to be how I planned it to go. It doesn't have to be how I saw things turning out. God, I want your will. Not my will, but yours be done. Let's stand together at all of our campuses and let's pray that to God and ask that his will would be done in our lives. God, if there's anyone here today who has a situation that they're just struggling with and they don't understand, Lord, right now we declare not our will, but yours be done. God, it's not going our way. It's not going the way we wanted it. It's not going the way we planned it. But right now, God, we trust you 
and we declare that we believe that you can work all things for our good. And we want to say to you, God, your will be done, not ours. And God, if there's someone here today who's having a hard time submitting to a decision that's been made and treating a person with respect, God, I pray that you would speak to them about that issue. They can wrestle through that issue. Because God, there are parents, there are teachers, there are coaches, there are people in our life that you have placed over us, God. And right now, we don't always agree with them. We don't always like the decision. But Lord, there are times when you call us to submit, and I pray that you would speak to us about that. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. If you need prayer, come on down front. Otherwise, have a great weekend, everybody.